I'm reading again this morning from the New Testament in modern English, a translation a century ago of the New Testament by Helen Barrett Montgomery, an American Baptist theologian, teacher, and pioneer. And in so reading, a, a few snippets about, uh, about her life and her story. Her, her home was in Rochester, New York. Susan B. Anthony, 1820-1906, the noted woman suffrage, suffragist, and Mary Louis Gannett, two famous Rochester residents, encouraged Helen to become involved in Rochester civic life. Her public service began with her election as the first president of Rochester's Women's Educational and Industrial Union. She served as president for 10 years. And she wrote of her work, thus the Women's Educational Industrial Union was organized in 1893 by Susan B. Anthony and other Rochester ladies startled by the plight of a woman who having fainted in the street was confined overnight in jail for want of a better shelter. Its numerous programs under the forthright leadership of Mrs. Montgomery helped safeguard the interests of working women and strangers in the city, which had generally been designed as a man's world. Helen's concern for social reform and civic causes grew out of her biblical and theological formation. And so the story continues. So reading from Helen Barrett Montgomery's translation of the New Testament, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Since we stand justified as the result of faith, let us continue to enjoy the peace we have with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him also we have had our access into this grace in which we have taken our stand and are exulting in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we are actually exulting also even in our troubles. For we know that trouble works fortitude, and fortitude character, and character hope, a hope which never disappoints us. For though the Holy Spirit has been given to us, the brimming river of the love of God has overflowed in our hearts. For while we were still without strength, Christ died in due time for the ungodly. Why, a man will hardly give his life for another, even a righteous man, though perchance for a good one, man, one might take it upon himself to die. But God gives proof of his love to us by the fact that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. By how much more then, being justified in his blood, shall we be saved through him from the wrath of God? For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved in his life? And not only that, but we exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained our reconciliation. While we were yet sinners, loving God, we give thanks for those of old who perceived that in Jesus, crucified, resurrected, in the spirit, in the community, you were doing a good thing, a new thing, a good and new thing that we are still seeking to understand. For Paul, who gave testimony to that, for many that followed in his stead, the sheroes and heroes, and for translators like Helen Barrett Montgomery, wanting us to understand in our own time and in our own tongue 
the word from of old. We give thanks. Amen. So well done. Well done. The fact that you are here this morning indicates that you successfully set your clocks forward. Now, you know, some clocks are easier to set than others, and I, I saw some chart on the internet of how to, to set your clocks forward. There's manual clocks, and, and the advice for a clock radio was just, or, or car radio was just leave it alone. It'll be good enough in six months from now. So. <laughs> But congratulations, you set your clocks. You got out of bed. You saw that it was raining, and you made it to church. And your reward? Pastor Jim's gonna talk to you about sin. <laughs> A century ago, Calvin Coolidge was the president a president known for being taciturn, a, a man of few words. Uh, his nickname was Silent Cal. And one summer he returned to his New, New England home to go to church and the press followed him. And when he came out, they asked him, uh, what was the minister's sermon about? And Coolidge replied, sin. Well, what did he say about sin? He was against it. <laughs> While we were yet sinners, Paul writes, Christ died for us. In Christian theology, there is a doctrine of original sin. I don't think we need to accept that doctrine, doctrine in total. It was... A, formulated, I think, at least first by the, the theologian Augustine, who, who recognized that, you know, from a very early age, even in babies, we sometimes have a hard time knowing what's best for us and acting accordingly. And, and, and Augustine developed this, this theory, reading the scripture, that it was just serin, sin is part of uh, what Adam and Eve have bequeathed to us. It just, we can't escape it. And I'm not sure that teaching about original sin is all that accurate or all that helpful, because while sin is invasive, the biblical word, and we see it in Paul's letter today, the biblical word is that while sin is invasive, it's grace that is pervasive. It's grace that surrounds us. It's grace that owns us. It's grace that claims us. Sin is invasive. Grace is pervasive. And in fact, I think it is more accurate in speaking of what the Bible teaches us of God and theology to talk about original love than to talk about original sin. That being said, sin is pervasive. Now, I don't know about the church of your youth that you grew up in, but in the church I grew up in, there was frequent mention of sin. But sin was very closely and narrowly defined. It was smoking, drinking, and cursing. All of which my wife did yesterday. <laughs> we lived in a world with rampant racism. That wasn't the sin. It's smoking that brought hell on earth. So we have, over our history, defined sin conveniently. We've defined sin as out there. Uh, and if, if there's something, in my church it was these, these personal behaviors. 
It had little to do about the structures of society, the structures that crushed people and killed people. And so I think we need to hear, we need to hear honestly, directly, Paul's concern while we were yet sinners. He recognizes that sin is indeed invasive. We need to claim that grace is pervasive. But let's, let's look a little closer on about what we might mean. For Lakeshore Avenue Baptist Church, for our society, when we talk about being sinners, we, we hear the phrase frequently, we're all sinners saved by grace, fair enough. We hear, love the sinner and hate the sin. Sometimes it's really difficult to get all wrapped up in hating the sin and the sinner just becomes collateral damage. People far more intelligent and thoughtful than I have tried to teach meaningfully about the pervasiveness of sin. I'm reading from Otis Moss III, pastor at uh, Trinity Church in Chicago, and he's quoting Dr. Martin Luther King. Dr. King saw that we are capable of extraordinary feats, yet we often fall short. What would help any of us to live better? Life it should be, life as it should be, and life at its best, he saw, taught, is life that is complete on all sides. And so Dr. King is saying that to know sin and to sin is to live an incomplete life. And it starts to resonate. Life that is complete on all sides. He described the three sides. The first is personal, authentic fulfillment of the self. The second is communal, social engagement and responsibility. And the third side is spiritual, our sacred kinship and connection with all creation. So for King, sin is a brokenness, a brokenness in our personal lives. And that starts to ring true. A brokenness in our social lives, our engagement with society and those around us, that starts to ring true. And the third is spiritual, our sacred kinship and connection with all creation. And that starts to ring true as well. Dr. King liked to talk, the connection is, uh, Dr. King liked to talk about the three sides of a complete life as being like the dimensions of a house. It's height, width, and depth. If the architect draws the measurements wrong or the carpenters cut one beam too long and another too short, the entire house becomes unstable. In harsh conditions, it would collapse. But if the sides are in harmony, a well-measured, measured, well-built home can endure storms of all kinds, lasting a lifetime and beyond. So sin is a brokenness in this width, depth, and breadth of our house. The personal, the social, the spiritual, that threatens the well-being of the whole. That in a storm, the house is in danger of collapse. Have you seen pictures from Tahoe recently? Massive, massive snowfall on the roof. And many of the, most of the houses are still standing. I saw a picture this morning, a little bus stop, tiny little bus stop. Bus stop probably has a roof of about eight feet, and there's probably 16 feet of snow piled on it. But the bus stop is still standing. 
It's well constructed. The snows, they fall in our life. The storms, they come. And when the house is somehow not well constructed or broken in its construction, socially, personally, spiritually, we break. So Dr. King, far more than saying, y'all need to stop smoking, cursing, and drinking, as healthy as that might be, says we need to get it right. We need to get our spiritual lives right. We need to get our social lives right. We need to get our spiritual and personal lives. In a similar vein, a younger pastor, Dr. Jonathan Augustine, He's a pastor in North Carolina, and he's also a professor of law at North North Central Carolina University of, of Law. He talks about sin as being, standing in the need of reconciliation. And he too identifies three areas of need of reconciliation. Let me just read a little bit from his book, Called to Reconciliation. Reconciliation is one of the rare words that originates within the church but also applies in secular contexts. From a perspective with Christ at the center, it has to do with human beings reconciled to God through Jesus. This is what I call salvific reconciliation. So that's like King talked about uh, the need for Uh, the spiritual dimension of our life to be correct. Augustine talks about the, about salvific reconciliation. It's kind of a heavy duty word, but stay with it. This is what I call salvific reconciliation because it relates to human salvation. It's closely related to the, in the closely related social context, Reconciliation also has to do with human beings reconciled to one another as equals because of God's saving work. I call this social reconciliation. So here he claims the same word as as King does, uh, the need for the social dimension of life or social reconciliation. What's the difference between salvific reconciliation and social reconciliation? Augustine writes, whereas salvific reconciliation is focused on the kingdom to come, i.e. beyond this life, social reconciliation is part of the here and now and is focused on the kingdom of hand. And I like that. Uh, The dimensions of our lives. There's a dimension of our life that is concerned about the kingdom to come. There's also a dimension of our life that is deeply concerned about the kingdom at hand. Salvific, need for salvific reconciliation, need for social reconciliation. Augustine goes on to talk about a third area where there's sin and need for reconciliation, and he calls it civic, the need for civic reconciliation. And here we start to look at the structures of society. Um, Civic reconciliation is presumably fueled, is what presumably fueled the Reverend Oliver Brown in Brown versus Board of Education, 1954. Uh, Consider Reverend Brown. As a minister of St. Mark's African Methodist Episcopal Church in Topeka, Kansas, Brown served in a denomination founded because of legal racial inequities and a desire for human equality. Brown sued the Topeka Board of Education on behalf of his daughter, Linda, who was denied admission to a local school because she was black. 
Describing the circumstances leading to litigation, legal scholars wrote, the lead plaintiff, Oliver Brown, was angered that his daughter had had to travel each day past a modern, fully equipped white school to a black school housed in a deteriorated building. By therefore filing suit, Reverend Brown, although he believed in salvation in the kingdom to come, sought to address systemic social equalities rooted in America's legal system in the kingdom at hand. Dr. Eldon Ernst is with us this morning, my history, church history professor, so he might challenge me on this afterwards. But it is my sense that over its vast history, this Christian church has done a much better job of talking about sal uh, salvific reconciliation than it has about talking, talking about civic reconciliation. It has greatly emphasized the kingdom to come and frequently ignored the kingdom at hand, leading to a less than adequate definition of sin. If there's a political figure that brought discussion about sin into prominence, it's President Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter, who now is in hospice care in Plains, Georgia. Jimmy Carter, who was a better president than he is given credit for and might be the best former president this country has ever known. Some of you will remember back in 1976, when Jimmy was running for president, he was running as an outsider. He was running as a former governor of a small southern state, Georgia, and he was running as this curiosity, an evangelical Christian, a born-again Christian. What in the world did that mean? And against the advice of his political advisors, still candidate Carter, wanting to get the word out about who he really was, consented to an interview with Playboy magazine. Remember that? Published in mid-September of 1776, the interview turned out to be a cultural and political bombshell. If only because the uh, author got Carter to talk about his attitudes on sex and adultery. And again, this is where traditionally, at least in the last 200 years, if Christians need to talk about sin, where do they turn? They turn to sex. Right? Carter thought he was being frank and open. He thought he was using the interview to explain to a secular audience that just because he was born again didn't mean he was self-righteous and judgmental, or in his words, just an ignorant peanut farmer. The thing that is drummed into us all the time is not to be proud, he told Shearer, not to be better than anyone else, not to look down on people. Carter earnestly explained to the reporter Christ set some impossible standards for us. Christ said, I tell you that anyone who looks on a woman with lust has already committed adultery. I have looked on a lot of women with lust. I've committed adultery in my heart many times. This is something that God recognizes that I will do, and I have done it, and God forgives me for it. And that's all anyone really remembered about the interview. And his, his point was he's trying to talk about, I have no reason to be judgmental. I have no reason to look down on others. But to this day, 
President Carter. Oh, wasn't he the lust guy? We have a hard time speaking about our brokenness. But Jimmy Carter would insist that he was more than the lust guy. In fact, one of our members, Cynthia, sent this just kind of out of the blue. This email to me last week. It's, I thought you might like this quote from Jimmy Carter. I have one life and one chance to make it count for something. I'm free to choose that something. Much more than lust. Much more than invasive sin. Pervasive grace making us free to choose something. My faith demands that I do whatever I can, wherever I can, whenever I can, for as long as I can. That's how Carter wants to be remembered. Not as a middle-aged man consumed by lust. But as a sinner, yes, but as a grace-filled person who can live his faith as long as he can, wherever he can, whenever he can, for as long as he can. It's, it seems to me to, to be a good example, very good example of invasive sin and pervasive grace. One more example. I don't know if you've been reading our little Lenten devotions. They're really quite good. They come from a, a, a Catholic perspective, so some of the language and traditions are a, a little distant to us, but this was yesterday's. And it was indwelling hope. I often catch myself wondering how the prodigal son could have mustered up the courage to return home much less have the chutzpah to hope for even a minimal welcome or, uh, or employment. How likely was it really that his father would employ such a miscreant? Given his situation, I certainly would have faltered anticipating rejection, coldness, a sibling's disdain, hope killers all. There was spiritual brokenness here. There was certain, certainly social brokenness. And this author is saying, if I was in the prodigal son, I would, be, I would be overwhelmed. I would be overpowered. I would be paralyzed by that brokenness. But, but, yet return he did, as do the prodigal sons and daughters among us who embrace improbable hope every day. They beg pardon for fracturing relationships. They regroup after rebellion or failure and return to family, occupation, faith. And all of us who turn our Lenten steps toward God must count ourselves among their number. In the face of spiritual brokenness, social brokenness, personal brokenness, in the face of the need for reconciliation, salvific, societal, civic, we still turn back. We're here this morning, not because you thought Pastor Jim would pound into you what miserable sinners you are. That's not why you set your clocks forward to. Because you, but because you believe that here you would hear a word of grace 
that in the face of their brokenness, our brokenness, there is reason for hope. That there's reason to believe that we can live our faith wherever we are, whenever we are, however we are, for as long as we can. Paul put it this way, while we were yet sinners, while we were still weak, Christ died for us. And grace abounds. That's an oversimplification. Yes, sin is invasive. But grace is pervasive. And even when we think there is no reason for hope, set our clocks forward, we go to church, we turn back. While we were yet sinners, there is reason, ample reason, to hope. Jimmy Carter's in hospice. Won't live that much longer. And there will be, at his passing, marvelous eulogies and memorial services. And some, almost in jest, will say, wasn't he that lust guy? But you know what they're going to focus on? The way... He went to work to heal brokenness, personal, social, societal, grace. Amen.